Okay. <laughs> Welcome everyone to a program put on by the sponsored by the Red Barn, which is as some of you know is just down the street. Um, you know, as the forests uh, reclaimed the land in New England, uh, animals were able to reestablish themselves in places where they had been before but couldn't survive on rough pasturage. And the bears are one of those animals. So we're happy today to have Michael Mor Morelli here as an expert on bears. He's uh, with the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Massachusetts, Central District Wildlife Biologist. And he knows a lot about bears. So basically, they, they titled it and I went with it, What About the Bears? What about the bears? Well, they're here, so I'm gonna go through basic bear biology, where they came from, where they're going, what they do, how scary they are, how scary they're not, and what you need or should be doing to limit your interactions with them. So without further ado, we'll start with life history. Cubs are born in the den January, February, late December, sometimes. Um, and they'll stay with the, the mother for a year and a half, so she only comes in estrus every other year. So bears only, a single bear only breed once every two years. And that uh, time of year is June and July. That is when I get the most calls about bears in places they should not be. That is because the yearlings, which I call the teenagers, you're called my office and say I got a little bear in the yard, like a teenager. So that, that's the bear that's with its mother for the second year. And they're usually, let's go this way, I got a pointer now. They're usually about that big. The mom's about that big. They're about the size of a German Shepherd looking. The cubs with all the fur and stuff, but they're only about 60 pounds. So they're dispersing. The females will disperse to the fringe of the, the female's range. The males are the ones that I get all the calls about. They're just trouble. They'll go hundreds, 50, 100 miles. They're the ones that, we had one down the Cape a couple years ago. One went to Boston twice before we took them to the Berkshires. So those are the ones we really have to watch out for. Adult males, once they grow up and have their own territory, are solitary. So if you see a single bear, with no little ones around, it's probably a male. Females are about 140 to 300 pounds. This is about a 200 pound bear here. That's about a 60 pound one there. So that's about a 400 pound. People are horrible at estimating bears. I'm just getting good at it, I've been doing it for 15 years. But if you ever want to try to estimate what a size of a bear, see how prominent her ears are, given her head, and see how small those ears look. Ears on the bears are all the same size. Their skulls are not. So the bigger the skull, the smaller the ears, the bigger the skull, the bigger the bear. So if you call me and say, I got a big bear in the yard, I don't want to show up and see one of those. <laughs> Which happens all the time. Like, like I said, males can be over 450. The largest one I've seen in this state that I know the weight of actually is 550 pounds. It was the, bigger, the size of the back of a Toyota. It, it, was, it was massive. So what do they eat? Kind of a, it's kind of a yearly trend. That skunk cabbage you probably see in the wetlands, it's just starting to pop up in central southern Worcester County. It's not, not near my house yet in northern Worcester County. But they'll eat, that's kind of what they're targeting, but they'll eat grasses, anything, any green shoots. It's got skunk cabbage, like I said, any leftover nuts or roadkill, anything they can find. Um, acorns have been terrible the last couple of years, so that hasn't helped anything. Deer fawns, opportunistically, they actually probably eat more deer fawns than coyotes. That's a whole other side topic I'd rather not get into right now. Um, that one. I'm going to beat that to death tonight. And that's the number one, you can't beat pound for pound, and the caloric value, we'll go with that shortly, of black oil sunflower seed. So where do you find them in the spring? Well, there. <laughs> wherever these are, but typically on a truly wild bear you'll find them in, in wetland dominated habitat. So the wet seeps that have thawed out first, that have a little bit of green stuff. So food is scarce that time of year. Again, bird feeders, human associated foods. There, I can't think that I'm going I'm to pound that in tonight. Summer, a little less likely to be in the yard at bird feeders, but um, blueberries, blackberries are a real big one. Uh, tore open logs, they'll tear open logs, finding larvae, bees' nests. We'll touch on bees later on. Uh, wasp nests. <coughs> oh, yeah, and those. <coughs> um, so 
So in the summer you find them in the general forest, Holden Town Forest has them in it. Logged areas especially, because you'll find a lot of the, the pony blackberries, raspberries and whatnot in there. In fields and orchards as crops are coming in, so apple orchards with the, the young apples on them and stuff. Then we get to fall, corn, corn fields, I'll show you some corn damage in a future slide here. Um, beech nuts, those actually were pretty good last year, hickory nuts are pretty good. Acorns were scarce, which is usually the primary diet. Um, deer carcasses are from hunting mortalities, the deer breeding seasons in the fall, so they're very active. You probably see them crossing the road and stuff. Oh, and those. Uh, interesting quick side story, I'll tell you a lot of quick side stories. Orchard bears in the Connecticut Valley that, that tend to, to flock towards apple orchards where the, there's not a lot of people, there's not a lot of bird feeders, um, they get drunk on apples, and it's hilarious. Aww. They get a lot, of, a lot of rotten apples. So again, up in the forests and a lot of fields and orchards. So that's kind of their yearly cycle. They can deviate from that, but generally speaking, I'm going to try to keep things general. So why do bears hibernate? Well, hundreds of thousands of years of adaptation, they've adapted to a seasonal food shortage. They can't find much when there's three feet of snow on the ground. And they're, they're programmed, they're just genetically programmed to gain weight starting end of summer, something kicks over in their brain and they, they just go into gorge mode and they'll eat till they're sick. Go to sleep, get up, do it again. So they're basically they're physiologically adapted to search for high calorie foods. Oh, and uh, yeah, that one, again. Yeah. High calorie foods, you, again, you cannot beat black oil sunflower seed. You know, we'll go over that shortly. But uh, garbage is becoming more prevalent. Um, other unsecured food sources, chickens. Mm -hmm. Bears are learning, it's actually very interesting, completely independent of each other, that backyard chickens are great to eat. <laughs> they're, not being, they're not learning this from each other, they're finding it on their own because there's just so many backyard chickens now. So that's actually an emerging problem that we're trying to get ahead of a little bit through education. So basically, bird feeders equal conflict to get your bears in your yard, gets the bears in the neighborhoods, and that's when they get themselves in trouble. So population, what do we have around here? Well, we found we ongoing studies, we'll get into that here shortly, but we'll kind of start at the end and work backwards. The female survival rate, which is the ones that are reproducing, making more, more bears, is over 85%. So eight, about 80 out of every 100 females that are born are making it well into reproductive age. And that includes, we have hunting seasons, that includes road mortalities, everything we can find, and we're still getting an 88%. Like I said, it has the most important impact on population. Age at first reproduction, this is also interesting. Um, we're seeing changes in this. If you go out to the Berkshires up in the big hills, at three, usually four years of age is when they have their first cub. Um, around here, we just had a bear we did this winter that should not have had cubs. She was two years old, she had a cub. Completely surprised us. It's, it's almost undocumented in the Northeast, which is very, very interesting. But we're seeing more and more in that because she went, went into hibernation with such good body condition, so much fat, that she was able to actually successfully have a cub. Michael, will that two-year-old have the wear for all to take care of those cubs? In this case, no. But there was a cub present. So I said, average litter size, first litter is almost always a single cub. After that, two, more often three, sometimes four. So what's the status of them? Where are we now with the population? It's expanding exponentially. It's expanding very quickly. We're estimating 4,500 to 5,000, and that's almost 100% west of 495, so exclude that whole eastern portion of the state, and that's about how many we have. And they're moving eastward into underoccupied and unoccupied habitats, so the North Shore, the South Shore, the like Cape, First bear on the Cape was a couple years ago in 150 years. First one documented across the canal before the canal was even there. Um, they're utilizing urban areas more and more. Um, we're finding them in Northampton. We have them denned under porches. It's kind of a it's a kind of a circus out there with bears and people. Some people love them. Some people hate them. Some people love them so much they feed them endlessly. And those bears' home ranges are about as big as this building. Other bears can be. 50 square miles. Like I said, there's large, there's plenty of room still east of 495, there's still plenty of room in town here. 
I have quite a few more bears, and I got some interesting slides coming up on where bears are. So, dark green is we have established bear ranges, almost full, right in the, the margin here, maybe not, but this is completely occupied. One sow's range touches the next, touches the next, touches the next. We figure ranges by the females. The males, they wander all over the place. Their ranges can be 10 times the size. The females have a pretty set range, and they, you'll see them slide in a minute, they butt up to each other almost like a jigsaw puzzle. It's, it's quite interesting. So that's Holden. This is places we've had bears on a regular basis, but don't really have any solid data on if they're staying there or they're just moving through. Like I said, we have a lot of reports of um, yearling males, the teenagers, ending up here, there, over here, over here. This guy ended up over here, he came back over here, he was back over there. True story. They, their homing instinct's tremendous too, so we try not to move and we'll get into that later. So what is the current research? These are just some of the grades up to and including myself. Uh, this is actually one of the longest running research projects in the country for bears. It started in 1980, so what's that put us at? It's almost 40 years of continuous data on different lineages of bears and whatnot. So the first first step is pretty basic reproductive success, cub survival, home range, movements, habitat, basically trying to build a population before they had fancy computers to run modeling and all that type of stuff. Second one was 1993, population dynamics and three different habitat types. That was basically the Connecticut Valley, the Berkshires, and some urban areas out there. It was, there were no bears around here, more no, relatively speaking. And again, develop uh, another population model because everybody wants to know how many bears are here. And that's the same information we use to set the hunting seasons, which are fairly limited. It's kind of hard to hunt bears in this state, but it is, it is a thing. Third projects, um, effects on, this is when we actually started seeing a lot of the bird feeder bears popping out at the end of this one. So the effects of food supply and nutrition and reproductive success, that's where we're getting the cub numbers and survival rates and all that stuff. And we're refining the model from here I got a whole hour presentation on that, but we're not going to do that tonight. Current one, which is now, it's been going on for almost, what's that, 20 years then? No, 10 years. Can't do math, that's fine. 20. <laughs> is it 20? 20. Yeah. I've been, up, I've been up a while. Um, again, we're, we're trying to refine female productivity and survival, habitat use now in Worcester County and going eastward. Human bear interaction, we have actually have a whole position at our headquarters to deal with wildlife perceptions, people's wildlife perceptions, bears included. Um, in 2009, we got a grant, and it's an ongoing grant. It has a GPS collar component, which is what that is. And you gotta chase them around to download these things on a certain day, which is a lot of work. But if you ever call in and say, I saw a bear, I want you to look for two things. Did it have a collar, and what, kind of, what color was the collar? And did it have ear tags, and what color was the ear tag? You want us to get close enough no. to see your tags. <laughs> if you're close to, if the bear's in your yard, you're looking out your window and it's got a certain color tag, you're going to see it. If it doesn't have it, you won't see it. And we'll tell you what the different colors mean because I don't want to give you a bias. So while I'm thinking of it, I threw this slide in this morning right here. Barrel traps. That's what I'm going to be start start doing probably next week. You've probably seen a truck going through town with a bunch of big barrels on the back that camouflage them and grab them from our barn and doing stops along the way. But if somebody has a bear habitually, they're on the edge of town, has a bear habitually in your yard, and you're not necessarily feeding it, and it's got cubs, give me a call. They may want to try to get in one of these barrel traps, give it a health check, see if it's a bear that's been marked before by us with an ear tag, and if it's not, bring it into the study. Because you'll see in a minute why I want to do it. There's a large data gap right, literally right in town here that I don't have any information on bears in this area, north or south. So what we're working on with this study, what I'm working on is changes in habitat use from rural to urban, kind of a gradient, so coming off like the Quabbin area, the range sizes and, and what food sources are utilizing as they're heading east, as they are heading east. Landscape resistance, fancy term for what are the roads doing to slow them down, are they slowing them down? Connecticut River doesn't do it, Mass Pike doesn't do it, so does 290 and 190 do it? Probably not, but we also got a grant with the Department of Transportation. They're giving us a whole bunch of money for these callers too, to identify where these bears cross. They cross in 
locations that are probably you could we could figure out they're they're pretty consistent. Um, so we're trying to figure that out and either put fencing up so they can't cross there or make it better so they can cross there because mm -hmm. they're going to cross somewhere. So we're trying to do it on spots, <coughs> not corners and straightaways. Put them on straightaways. Stable isotope analysis, fancy word for how much bird seed are they eating. <laughs> we can look at um, some of their blood work DNA and then break out different particles. I'm not going to get into all that. I'll blow the heck out of you. <laughs> and then again, how many bears are there? We're trying to rework the population estimate density because the number of bears per square mile in the Berkshires is far less than the number of bear square, bears per square mile in Northwest County. Way more bears down here than there are out there per square mile. Just way more food. I couldn't quite fit that one in there, but uh, the public's perception of bears, that's kind of self-explanatory. That's probably why half of you are here. So this is the fun stuff. Female home range, so let's just measure the sows, west of the Connecticut River. Connecticut River is right there. About 15 square miles. So they're all stacked in there. Um, every color here is a different research bear. Current, past, present. We're right there. I have nothing on information for out here. I just got a bear, that one that had the cub. She's up in Princeton, so she's going to be filling in this. But we'll get a little bit better here. I'll actually go back here. You see how the, the habitat's fully utilized here. And the, this is a very urban area, as is down here. So these are a little bit more overlap. Less bears here, more food, so they just kind of spread themselves out, right now at least. Um, show there's more bears that'll fit in, but we just don't have in the study in there. Same thing, a little bit closer. We're literally sitting right there. This is as close as the research bears I've had to here. These are all the Worcester County ones. Zoom in a little closer. There's 122A, there's 31. So I've had a bear right about down by valves at one point, walking through. So this is one. Got red, purple, and yellow. That's three different bears that I still have in the Wachusett area. I'll have, well, like I said, I have one more up here that's not, no data collected yet. So I'd like to get something right along 190 over here. Mm -hmm. See how they're utilizing this, to see how they're utilizing Worcester. Mm -hmm. um, we had a research bear. She's not on here. She was very old, actually, deceased of natural causes, but would go down into Tatton, right down into, into Worcester. <laughs> That was always fun every other year or so, moving her out. So conflicts with bears, which is probably why a lot of you are here, how to, how to live with them. Um, this was a, a house we, not, I, not, not this district, next district to the West Connecticut Valley. Woman calls up, all worried there's bears in her yard. Why are they here? Well, bird feeder, trash can full of food scraps. Pretty explanatory. Um, explain, yeah. So, these are all our pictures. These weren't scalped off the internet. These are pictures sent to us that we've taken, that our photographer's taken. Um, that right there is a guilty bear. So is that one. But they'll, they'll do, regardless of what's going on in the woods for berries or acorns or anything like that, they'll get into this stuff all year, every day. You see these pictures in the middle of the summer. You know, they don't have to be here, but it's way easier to eat cheeseburgers and birdseed than it is finding berries in a, in a briar patch. Estimate the weight of those? Um, that guy is about 160. He's a little bit bigger, he's a little wet, so he's a little soggy, he might be 200. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he's on both of those, I don't know exactly. And then I'll do this just for uh, emphasizing it. 99% of the conflicts of bears and people revolve around food. 85% of those revolve around that right there. <laughs> Bird feeders. <laughs> oh, I told you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound that in. Um, that one's in Paxton. That one, I don't know where that one came from. That's from western part of the state. But you live in area of bears. They're here. Um, at least one bear that was in the study used Holden on a regular basis. She didn't den here, but it was in the, edge, the fringe of her range. She has two cubs, or have since parted with two cubs. I don't know where they went exactly, so they definitely could be in town. So you have bears colonizing town. You'll have resident bears in five years that live here 24-7, 365. The ones now are using the edges of town, I think, or we think. So it's best not to put out feeders. No one wants to hear that, but that's what I have to tell you. But if you do choose to put them out, mid-December, 
get them in by the end of February, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, another side story, I like side stories. We had a bear down by Four Corners, I'm sure most of you know where that is over in Rutland, a research bear. Doing, I was doing the downloads on her a couple winters ago and figuring that she should be, she had yearling cubs, so she had teenagers, they were all males, so we weren't really interested in, in calling them, so we didn't have to handle them. So we went off to do the download, and she wasn't where she was supposed to be. She moved. All right, got the download, got the gut back, got the data, which was a bunch of those dots, and she was doing zigzags, crisscrosses, and X's through the same spot near Four Corners. It's kind of weird. Is that a den site? Like, what, what is, what's there? Walk in, full weight sheet of plywood, about 80 pounds of bird seed on it. Oh, uh, went and talked to the, the gentleman, understood what he was doing. It's not illegal, so I can't stop him. Suggested he didn't do that. I don't know if he stopped. She, she, I think he did for a little while, but the point of the story is that bear never den. Her cubs never den. She had a couple of, of day beds near the bedrock golf course where she'd sleep through a storm, but she never stopped because she could stay awake in sub-zero weather and still net gain calories. So she never had the the need to shut down. So she was relying solely on people for food, and that's that's not a good thing. Luckily, she's moved to a different part of her range last year. I don't know what she's going to be this year, so she wasn't near that that source this time. So to put it in perspective, a pound of acorns from the oak tree in your front yard is about 1,100 calories, hulls, husks, and all. One pound of black oil sunflower seed, hulls, husks, and all is 2,500 calories. And I double, triple check that, because I didn't believe it either, but I said you can't, you can't beat it. Put some millet in there or something to break it down. Um, garbage, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, even a plastic barrel with just a twist on lid will keep the honest bear honest. If it wants to get in, it's going to get in, but it's usually not going to waste that much time trying to do it. Um, this is a note, that's a, that's a collar. That's an older style, so it's a little bit bigger than the ones we use now are smaller. So store garbage is a secure building. I keep mine in the garage behind the door until it has to go out. And I put it out in the, mor this, in the morning, which was actually this morning. I almost missed the truck because it came early. And just you know, put, it, put it in the can, but that in town, they, everybody has the can anyway, so that doesn't really matter. So conflicts with bears. That's another Paxton bear. Guy sent me that picture. thought it was cute. Okay. Um, Bears are smart. Bears have a heck of a memory. You probably have read that or heard that. Um, if you call me up or I talk to somebody, I kind of made this word up, food reward. So it's like a dog. Kind of like, think of it like a dog. If the bear goes for a whole bunch of effort, knowing it shouldn't be somewhere and it gets something tasty, it's probably going to come back and try it again. I should say, it will come back and try it again. And then remember that. It might not be tomorrow, it might not be next week, it might be next year, but it'll come back to that spot and try to get whatever it got, whether that be chickens or bird seed or garbage. So the food source has to be removed. Well, someone's, you know, they call me up, I got a bear, I don't want it in my yard, okay, take your bird feeder in, okay, it came back. Okay, it's got to come back three, four, five, six, a hundred more times. Eventually it'll stop, because it's not worth its time anymore. And the other thing is, alright, I took my bird feeder and the bear's still here. Well, my neighbor's got 16 bird feeders out. <laughs> well, you better go talk to your neighbor. Because bears are going to go through your yard to go back and forth. But you, you got to do it on a community level. That's about the only way, you, you know, the whole block or the whole section of town would have to take the bird feeders in to keep the bears in the woods looking. No. This came in last year. I'll let you read it. This photo was emailed to us by a frantic person about how to keep bears from getting near her house. She took that picture. It's like, why is the bear here? <laughs> huh, I wonder. She's just taken her feeders in and I haven't heard from her since, so. And that's in the summer. That's in summer. That's uh, late spring. <laughs> that's probably a 120 pound bear. Maybe, maybe a 100. I think that's a sheet, that one. So, bears will learn it themselves and they'll teach their kids. That that's a this year's kind of cup, so that's about 20 pounds. Those are actually cute to watch, but she's eating trash, he's learning. He'll do the same thing. And this is kind of a trend we're seeing. The more 
time bear spend around people and we can verify this with the research base because we can see where they are with their GPS collars. Not in real time, when we download it, they send us a ping every 75 minutes. So when we download them once a month, we can see where they are, what they're doing. So the more time any of these research bears, actually you'll see right, right there is something you could look for if you see a bear in your yard. It's near your tag, that's a newer collar, a little smaller. That's the same picture as before. But they just get used. This is coming up somebody's front steps. This is the Paxson one again. I don't know where those other two came from. Intentional feeding. So this this is not the guy down by Four Corners. This is out by Quabbin. Um, <coughs> this guy thought this was a great idea. The, the female would come in. A couple females would come in. They'd have cubs. It was the greatest thing. Until June came around and a 500 plus pound boar ripped the guy's swing set down out of anger. Didn't think it was a good idea anymore after that. So his house, somewhere in the middle of this, bears in the middle of summer should not be that concentrated, or that bear should not be that, but every, we put lines in between, every track should walk out here, do something, come back for more, come back for more, come back for more. I'll show you some other stuff. So this is out in the west, is 91. This woman thought it was a great idea to feed bears by the 100 pound bag. Now this is 91, that's a major six lane highway. So there's one of our research bears when they found out where it is. There's two. Now they're crossing the highway. There's three. And how many more bears that we don't have collars on, we don't know. But um, the town actually, so the city town, I'm not sure what that one was, has a bylaw. Makes it illegal to feed bears. There's a fine line between feeding wildlife birds, feeding bears, but uh, she was financially made to stop. Um, no bears were hit on the highway. Her neighbors, the whole town, the whole street here were not fond of her. Because all these bears are using all their yards. So, don't do it intentionally. It's not illegal. I'm not going to lie to you, it's not illegal, but don't. It's not a good idea. Feeding the birds with a few pounds at a time is fine. Doing it intentionally is not. Up and coming stuff we're seeing, the chickens. They're finding backyard chickens at an alarming rate. Um, independently of each other. Only way they're going to keep those safe, this is actually one out of Sturbridge late last year. Tore the side out and no more chickens left. Um, same with beehives, but that's kind of been known. Adequate electric fencing. And there's a sheet on the back table by the door that has general overview. If you go to our website, mass.gov slash bears, which I'll show you in a little while, there's an in-depth how-to with amperages, joules, spans, distances, all sorts of stuff that's the tried and true amount for, for keeping a bear, keeping an honest bear out. Once he's got a taste, nothing's going to keep him out. So you got to do away with the chickens for a little while and let them move on and then, and then start over. Uh, fence must be baited and maintained. That's another, another thing. This fence was just thrown up, um, not maintained, not baited. Like I said, the bears already had, that was a bear that already had honey decided the electric fence didn't hurt bad enough and went through anyway. Properly maintain ones. Um, this is key if you're going to do it. Put the fence up as directed. Even the temporary ones, like backyard chickens, just move it every couple days. This will keep an honest bear on it still. But you got to do this. That's a piece of tin foil with um, peanut butter on it. So if a bear runs through an electric fence with his shoulder, I'm not going to hurt. He sticks his tongue on it, It'll work. So again, that's the information's back there. I'm not going to get into too much depth with that. Agricultural damage. Apple orchards, we get a few calls a year about that. Um, there's just not much you can do other than invite, because this is used to fall, invite hunters out to the, the property, but bears will actually tear apart an apple tree from the top down. Corn, that's a corn field. There's the tractor. It's uh, cutting it, but this is all caused by bear. It'll sit there and then just, just rake, it, rake it in. So that's actually a, a in the Connecticut Valley, this is actually a big problem. They'll, they'll lose five, six acres a week to bears. Resolving conflicts. Well, taking steps to prevent them is the biggest, easiest way to do it. Don't start a conflict, it's even easier. Um, if you already have, a, you know, see bears in the air, they visit you, you know, try to bring the bird feeders in. If nothing else, bring them in at night. 
It might slow the problem down. That's the best solution is to prevent it altogether. Um, I'm going to touch on this real quick. We don't relocate bears because they're there. We don't re relocate anything because it's there. Bears especially. Got a call the other day. I want this bear out of here. My neighbor's feeding the birds. It comes from my yard. I'm scared to go outside. Go talk to your neighbor. We're not moving bears. If we do have to remove a bear, we actually have a team. I'm part of it. It's us as biologists, and we also have the, the game wardens, environmental police, are part of this. We have tranquilizers, fancy equipment, stuff like that, make the bear go sleepy, sleepy for a little while. That's only in very limited situations. Um, proximity to roads and urban areas, you know, Tatnick Square in Worcester, school's getting out in an hour. Well, we've got to do something. Um, it's on the median of the highway, let me move those too. Um, this one, this part right here, people problem, another, another term I made up. This happens in Starbridge for some reason a lot, three or four times now. Bear comes into town overnight, bird feeders, trash, berries, you name it, I don't know why it's there. Town wakes up early in the morning, sees it, oh god, a bear is in the tree, two people, five people, a hundred people. Yeah. Now where's the bear going to go? Even the, you, know, you just can't keep the people away, the cars, if they're flocking to it, those bears, if we can't get the people away, will be moved if need be. We'd rather not. Um, the drugs we use are pretty strong to knock these down. They give them one heck of a hangover, I'd imagine, when they wake up. So we'd rather not do that. So, we, you know, people, towns call us. Holden hasn't called me yet. Hasn't happened in town that I know of yet. But some of the other towns are getting used to it, up towards Templeton, that type of stuff. Town PD gets a call, we got a bear, okay, they just go cruise here, keep people away. Problem fixes itself, no problems. Habituated bears cannot be relocated, that kind of speaks for itself. If it's pushing in a door, breaking into a garage, pushing in a window because there's bird seed on the other side, I'm going to say it, euthanized bear, period. So don't, you know, try to prevent conflict. <coughs> don't store bird seed in a place. Don't store birdseed, period, if you can help it. If you can buy it as you need to do that. Um, hasn't happened in Worcester County yet. It's <coughs> happened out in the Berkshires where some of the summer camps, they have all their food stored, bears push in through the summer porches. On multiple occasions, the same, we mark the bear, same bear. It can't be relocated. There's nowhere to bring it. It's going to do the same, it's either going to come back or it's going to do the same thing again. In reference, the bear we brought to the Berkshires went to Boston two more times. So, on our website, mass.gov bears, or you can Google the same thing, Massachusetts Bears. Um, all sorts of information. This pamphlet's on the back table if you want to leave. We've got some videos. A version of this one's back there. There's a better one online with a lot more detail. It's about how to electrify your, your coops. Your, your, I didn't touch on bees too much, but same this thing goes with beehives. Um, little pocket guides you can print out or we stop at our office. We have them too. It's what to do if you see a bear how to react, that type of stuff. Um, general biology is on there. So what's the overall goal of all this? A healthy population of bears feeding on their natural food sources, living amongst us compatibly. That's what we're all striving for. This was uh, one of the dens this year, kind of cute. So that's the, the overview. I'm anticipating a lot of questions, concerns, comments, so we're gonna we'll switch over to that part if you want. Uh, I do want to say one thing before we get to that. Might curb some of the questions. <coughs> Bears aren't scary. Think of them kind of like a 200 pound skunk. Just to kind of put it in perspective. Um, the only, there's never been a fatal attack in Massachusetts. There have been people injured by bears. I guess the best way to put it. One involved a dog. And it was literally a tear in the pants and a scratch. A mosquito bite was worse. And one bear bit a woman on the butt while she was gardening. We have no idea why he did that. <laughs> but both those, the bear either involved the dog and or the bear was startled. So the best thing you can do if you, well, best thing you can do, period, whether you're scared of bears or not, I, I even do it. Got a bag of trash, I got a dirty diaper, I got to go out to the trash can to get rid of it. Flick the light on and slam my screen door. I'm not going to surprise anything around the side of the house. And we think that's where it's going to happen. A bear is, someone's going to walk around the side of their house, bears come the other way. They're two feet apart. Bear style is going to do a defensive, not aggressive, but do a defensive strike. It happens in Florida, it happens in Jersey. That's what we think is going to happen. At some point, 
So the best thing you do is flick your light on, give it five seconds, make a little bit of noise, let it know you're there, whether it's a bear out there or not. I, I'm just used to doing that. It's usually just the raccoons. But. So on that note, well, let's go through a bunch of questions. Which is a moment ago you mentioned conflict often involves dogs. Could you explain how that works? Yep. Um, not so much out in the woods, like if you're walking a dog down the rail trail and stuff like that. Never, I don't know of anything which are kind of a bit of a problem like that. It's um, five in the morning, you get ready for work, your dog wants to go outside, you flick the light on, throw the door open. Oh crap, there's a bear in the yard. Mm -hmm. The bear is going to defend itself. You're going to try to defend your dog. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so again, just flick the light on, look out there for a second. <laughs> and just make sure there's nothing standing there. Um, the other one that involved, the one that, the dark man one was out by Belchertown that did involve a dog. A couple of, um, I think high school age girls walking their dog on a leash. For some reason a bear, a mother bear and two cubs came out of the side street out of the woods, spooked by something or whatever. Dog got off the leash, well, leash let, lost control of the leash. Dog got between the, one of the cubs and the mother, as the girl climbed up on the car, the oh. girl slid down to get the dog, and as the bear was swiping to get the dog away from the cub, actually that's the one with the jeans, it got the girl in the jeans and the arm a little bit. Two questions. Two? Yeah. I'm going to give you one. You know, are they legally hunted in the state, and where? Out oh, no, in the western part of the state? Yeah, you can legally hunt bears across the state. There are three short seasons, one in September, one in November, and one in early December. Um, it's all broken down the line. It, it's very, very regulated. It's very, you can't bait bears in Massachusetts. You can't use hounds in Massachusetts. So you, it's either opportunity, a lot of work, or shit luck. And I think last year we had less than 200 harvested statewide, which compared to other New England states is zero, zero percent basically. So again, on the Tatnick Square point line. Well, you can't discharge weapon in Worcester. Yeah. So the other, the other one is... Uh, you, you can hire and hold them if you could find one. Yeah, we've got them. <laughs> uh, the other one is, you, get, you said you get a lot of calls. People call you directly or they call the police and that police call you? Yes. Yeah, typically, yeah. Police call me, direct calls to me, my cell phone rings. Yes. yes. Headquarters calls over because they can't handle the volume. Like I said, it's, it's not usually now, it's usually breeding season, which is late May, early June around here, when the, the year the teenagers are getting run off, the males are all over the place, the females are getting chased around, they just Bears everywhere, going every which direction. So that's usually when I have the most calls. A couple of weeks ago, we were reading and hearing about a mother bear and some cubs that had been hibernating on a uh, out on Route Two on the inter on the what's that called? Center Lane. Center, Center, Center Lane. Lane. Yep. Yeah. It was really eerie walking on Route Two with no noise, no cars that morning. Strip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she had been there before. Oh. This wasn't the first time. We needed to get her collar changed. We do health checks every year, um, collar changes every two years. We check them every year to make sure the fit and finish is good. There's nothing mm -hmm. wearing, nothing chafing. We also check for the amount of cubs she has for the cub survival model. While we were in there, we're not going to leave her in the middle of Route 2. Yeah. So what should have been a two minute in and out turned into 50 plus people from Boston shutting both lanes down, diverting traffic <laughs> for an hour. But yes, um, like I said, we don't usually move bears, but we had to handle her anyway. And she was in that same spot the year before, but she had teenagers, mm. which were probably a little bit more apt to cross the road faster. But that being said, she's already moved through Templeton Center heading south. She didn't like where you put her. She stayed there for a week. We spent two <laughs> days building it. <laughs> well, I, was, I was out on Route 2 uh, last weekend, and my husband said, that's where the bear was. I had no idea when I was hearing on the news where this was. That's a quite wide piece of land in the center strip there. 84 feet. Oh, it looked like more than that. Oh, not, not including the grass. No, it was 84 okay. feet of woods. Of woods. Which okay. was 25 feet from the yellow line. Oh my goodness. Okay. So. Interesting. Regarding their health, what types of uh, diseases are you guys finding? Anything new? Anything? Nothing crazy. Rabies has popped up once, um, maybe twice, I'll tell you tomorrow. Mm. That's what I gotta do tomorrow. A strain, a bear a, acting odd in Ashburnham was euthanized a couple hours ago. So I guess I gotta check that. So they can carry rabies. Um, 
Distemper is rare, and then a bunch of stuff that, as long as you're not rolling around with a dead bear, you're not going to have a problem getting some various parasites and things. But other than that, they're they're extremely clean, and that's actually to bring back the root two down there. A lot of we have a lot of DOT high brass come out because look at me with a bear and take a picture um, while I'm trying to work. You know, but but they they even commented how how wow they're clean they're not dirty. I'm like. Their winter coats are shiny, they're healthy, yeah. A spring bear is going to look kind of mangy and dingy. So if you see a bear when it's getting a little warmer, it's not going to have that nice, bright, shiny coat. It's going to be transitioning to a summer coat, so it's going to look kind of like crap. Mm -hmm. But so, it's perfectly healthy. So they're not loaded with ticks like deer? They can be, but they can groom themselves. They have a lot more articulation. So they can keep themselves a lot cleaner. Could you talk about uh, how fast they are? They look as though they're I can't outrun it. Yeah. I can sidestep them, I can't outrun them. No, they can do 25, 30 miles an hour for a pretty good, fa fast enough you don't want to be in front of them, if that ever came to be. I have a question. So I'm walking my dog, mm -hmm. the dog starts barking crazily, mm -hmm. and the bear's coming out kind of close to us. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to turn around and not run or run? Well, if your dog's already barking, the bear knows you're there. So you've already, mm -hmm. you're well ahead of the game with that. If it were me, I just, there's the bear, all right, stop. You just talk to it calmly. 99.9999999% of the time, it's going to turn around and go the other way. Mm -hmm. So if it follows you, don't run or run? It's, it I can't say it won't follow you, it won't follow you. Okay. But don't, don't turn and just stop, let go of the dog and turn and run, don't do that. If you, if you want to put space between yourself, keep the dog and just walk backwards. I still want to let go of the dog. Don't let go of the dog. Just be sure you take your foot down your back pocket. Yeah. So what do you what does Mass Wildlife do with the euthanized bears? They end up necropsy, so the one I gotta do tomorrow I do a necropsy. It was a uh, teenager basically, again a year and a half old bear. It's been in the yard for two days, lethargic, not moving much. Um, gave it then to further out, see if it'll move overnight. It didn't. Uh, my, well, I, I, I took off early, so I was halfway to daycare to get a haircut and got the call for this, so I sent my guys up and they were able to walk right up to it and literally, so we put it down, well the environmental police put it down, and then it'll go to Jamaica Plain in the morning to make sure it's not rabid, they'll test for some other other diseases that are not non commutable to humans, and to, to see what, to try to figure out what's wrong with it. So, so how about the ones that, the few that maybe are in a tree in, in the town, Near a school and whatever you have to, they have to shoot them when you don't think there's rabies. No, we, no, no. So, a a up in a tree is a completely normal behavior. A bear, <coughs> rabies presents itself a lot of times with aggression. Um, even more than that, it's just it looks like a drunk. Imagine a drunk possum, drunk skunk, drunk fox, drunk beaver. That's the biggest telltale sign. It can't. It's lethargic. It can't move well. Uh, like I said, we only had one rabbit bear. We got the call because it, this is out towards the Berkshires. It came out of the woods into a big horse paddock and was basically bulldozing the ground with its face. Mm. So that one was put down. It was, it was at the end stage. Ra rabies moves very quickly. <coughs> once once they're, they, they're symptomatic, they're, they're dead within about 24 hours at the most. Mm -hmm. So we, this one wasn't quite dead yet. But bears can get rabies. Bears can get other things. <coughs> Um, generally speaking, for, for mammals in the Northeast, they are probably the cleanest in terms of stuff, the nasties they can carry or don't carry. So a bear in a tree, well, if it has to come out, it'll get um, a dart with some drug in it that makes it basically, it, basically it paralyzes the muscles. It loses control of the muscles and loses perception, so it, it doesn't know where it is, but it can't. Like a deer or a moose we put down, or not put down, but have to tranquilize. The drugs you have to use for that, it is aware of what's going on, it just can't do anything about it. The drugs we can use for bears, they can't do anything about it, but they're not aware where they are anyway. Like I said, it must be one heck of a hangover coming out of that. So we'll, we'll, we'll dart in the tree. It's not like you see in the movies where bang, dart, bears asleep. If the bear's all amped up and it's warm, it could take five, six, ten minutes, twelve minutes. And then we have tarps and nets, we can catch them cool them down, they lose their ability to uh, regulate their body temperature, so they see their tongue hanging out. So we'll pack them with ice and move them somewhere better, usually within the same range. We don't want to dump them into somebody else's range. Um, that prevents, that's that bear-to-bear -bear conflict kind of thing. We've seen that happen where they'll get run out, especially the males, and end up in a really, really bad place. 
So like if we don't like to move and we can help but let it come down and go go about its business on its own. Is the climate having any effect on the length of hibernation or whether they have an A around that we, here? Or? We think it does, but we don't know. We think the, the generally milder, warmer winters, on a, you know, we're talking a 100, 150 year scale here, yes, but we, got, we have no way to weed out the bird feeders, basically. We have no way to weed out human food sources from those hibernation lengths or lack thereof. Yeah. So we're still trying to work on that with, the um, state of Maine's actually working on one of those where completely wild bears, as they call it, you know, the great north woods, nobody's up there, to see if those hibernation rates and lengths are similar on a different latitude to other parts of the country, other parts of the state. Are there bears that watch you sit down? Oh yeah. Or in, okay. My front steps, I can see the glow of the ski lights, and I've had a bear sitting on my front steps. <laughs> I have a research bear just over the hill from my house, well, I'm on this side of the mountain, but yes. yes. There, are, there are a lot of bears on, not a lot, there's... I've encountered one year, but there's a lot of hiking and whatnot, and I've never yep. heard of anyone say, okay. No, I've, the number of calls of people I've talked to that have actually walked up on a bear in the woods on accident is far less than you probably think. Mm -hmm. I've never done it, I know where they are. I, I've just never walked up on a bear that I didn't know was already there. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough around here yet to say you will encounter a bear on one of your hiking trips. And Rutland State Park? Oh yeah. A lot? Really? Okay. That, that's off fully occupied range. Someone <laughs> coming out of Barry. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> like Rutland State Park. Yep, yeah, that Whitehall and then Barry Falls goes all the way over to Hubbardston over to Barry. We have multiple bears collared in there. They're, have, their territories are butt each other. So there's no room for other bears in between yet. They'll, they'll shrink those as more bears come. So, Rutland State Park is full of bears. That, re relatively speaking, yes. I know they've always said chatter, talk, yep. noise. Yep. If you're hiking, you can click your poles or find your bear belt. You have to say, okay, walk around with a bear belt. Yep. Okay. okay, you don't no, do that no. with grizzlies, though. No. No, but that, that's just, just whistle. If you're on the lawn, just don't walk like a hunter stalking through the woods, just break sticks, just walk. Right, walk. And you'll never see them most of the time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, just, it's happen chance, you know, like I said before, you don't want to startle. That's the only, if you take nothing else away from this, from two things tonight, try to bring your bird feeders in <laughs> and don't startle them. They're here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Speaking about where they might or might not be around us, what about, you, you mentioned rail trail earlier, I can that. Just, just a, as a general. Are there bears there? In this, uh, Is there one right there right now? Probably not. Um, well, have they passed through there? Absolutely. Really? I don't believe there's any bears with a range in there because I think I would have got a lot more reports with the amount of activity that's on that trail. Mm -hmm. But I have had them on this side of the trail. Okay. I mean on this side, not in my office, but on the on the east side of the trail, which means they crossed over several times to get there. So. Yeah. You had mentioned that they are predating upon uh, deer fawns. Do Opportunistically. Do you, do you catch them on like wildlife cameras? Is that you've no, this, um, like quick another quick story? I like quick stories. A uh, guy called up out of Templeton, Royalston way, Birchill. It's kind of like Berry Falls, but a lot bigger, up by the New Hampshire line. There's a bear, a big bear, it's like the big picture we saw at the beginning, laying down near the road. I think it's injured, and there's a deer making funny sound, funny sounds towards a big doe. Strange. So I met the the game wardens up there and. The bear had long since left at that point. We found the daybed, and it had found the doe's fawn, mm -hmm. ate it, and the mother was basically trying to stare down the bear. Oh. Um, it's opportunistic. Bobcats are actually, take coyotes off the table. They don't really affect the deer. Bobcats are the biggest we're finding. Not our study, but the state of Connecticut did a study on the mm -hmm. northwest side of the state of bears, bobcats, and coyotes, bobcats were well over 50% of the mortalities of the study deer. I've seen a bobcat. Mm -hmm. bo bobcats, will, coming up south bobcats will actively search for fawns. Mm -hmm. If a bear walks across, he's going to grab it. That's mm -hmm. the way it is. Do you really have to worry about them when you're hiking or anything? Bears? The bobcats? No. No. You don't know about that, yeah. Right over here. I've only seen six bobcats in my 15 years, and one was in her backyard. Yeah. <laughs> or a front yard. I've had a bobcat in my yard. In well, I get, I get great pictures and phone calls. That's, I just never see them. Yeah. And I'm out in the woods all the time. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. They're beautiful, yeah. We've had bears in our yard maybe five or six times over the mm -hmm. last two or three years. And they always seem to be there later in the day. Is that when you would normally see them, or are they just everywhere and they just haven't made it to our house yet? Um, mm -hmm. night, <laughs> nights are most common. Bears generally aren't out during the day unless they're hungry. They're usually sleeping, but we're finding more and more, at least the Hampton, North Hampton, East Hampton, South Hampton, out by the Connecticut River, they're, they're so used to people that they're actually sleeping at night and the bears are out during the day. It's kind of strange out there, but that's, that's the exception of the rule. Generally, it's during the night or first thing in the morning is when most of the encounters happen, people see bears. Um, during the day is not unusual, but if I had to pick a time you're going to see a bear, it's going to be at 5 in the morning. Or at 9 at night when you hear a bang on your deck and your bird feeder just going We have one walking across our patio around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll, midday is rare, but they'll, all, all parts of the day more or less. Morning, the diurnal, so mornings and evenings are the, are the busiest. A little bit of a sidestep. I'm interested in a bear has her babies in the den during, when she's hibernating. She, she's not really hibernating at that point. She is, until she gives birth, she's just kind of hanging out. And then she'll actually go into a slumber after birth. The cubs know what to do, where to go, how to find food in, within her body. So they, she kind of, she'll go to sleep and the cubs will stay awake. And she's, she's not eating, but she has the nutrients to feed the cubs? They're physiologically adapted to know what, excuse me for a second, the, how much fat they need. So if she's not in good body condition, she will actually abort cubs or abort some of the cubs, all of the cubs, before they're even born. So the, they have some sort of a calculator in their head where they know, they know how, how much they need. So right now is when they're the hungry. So they come out of the dens, they're at the lowest weight they're gonna be, and they're just hungry. Yes, sir. So, uh, you talked about the numbers. Holden can sustain twice the number of bears that are now here, or? How many bird feeders are we talking? <laughs> well, I've got, I've got several. No, uh, <laughs> uh, I take them in in the evening. The, the, the town of Holden, with the, the ranges we're seeing now, um, if a bear set up the core of a range in the middle, you might be able to get two. With the size we're seeing, it's very limited data. You saw the, the handful I had around here. And we're talking 75 square miles. What's holding? 90, 80, 90, something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's room for one, but it's not going to set up that way. It's going to set up, you'll have one there, one over here, one over here, and one over there. And they're all going to butt up to the edge of town. Nothing's going to use downtown here. Right. Yeah. But that being said, as more bears dispersing from their parents, the core population, there's room for more. But there's no need to crowd themselves yet. But there's enough food in town, enough gardens, bird feeders, woods that we can double, triple, quadruple, tenfold that within you know 10, 20 years. It's going to take time. But so today you could probably have right now you probably have three or four females that use a portion of Holden, um, majority being mm. up you know Quinnipoxton end and then down towards the Worcester Reservoir is over on that side would be where I guess. There's not much down towards the highway right now. They're just not there yet. So what what has caused the the growth of the bear population? Why why has it grown over the past almost forty years? Well, they were they were gone. For, they were they were pretty much extirpated from the state in the thirties, twenties, thirties. Um, it's just been a natural reproduction. Um, there's always, pretty much, relatively modern history has always been a hunting season. Um, in this state, it, it's, not, it's not impactful to the, the population at all. It doesn't affect the model at all. Um, but it's, it's been habitat, there's been more and more logging, mature forests, there's just room for them to move. And now the last 20 years, they've been finding human-related food sources. They basically, basically come out of the mountains, come across the river, and now they're finding people finding food, finding it suitable, and they're staying. So a bear that in the Berkshires is having one or two cubs, out here is having three or four. So they're, they're, they're gaining speed here. 
fashion they are. And they take a lot of their land too, building houses and they're expanding all the time. They're they're adapting. They we have, need some place to go. They're using smaller and smaller areas. We had a bear in uh, Sunderland that set up shop behind a sushi restaurant. You know, <laughs> in, a, in a little wet spot they couldn't build in. And that's that's where she dens and hangs out and then just hits the dumpsters and whatnot. <laughs> so if, if there's no room, they'll find room if, if there's enough food. Food is the, the single driving factor. There has to be enough food to support the bear or the bears for them. If there's not, then they're going to go wider and wider for a range. So you have less and less bears per square mile. Yeah. The female bear that you mentioned earlier that you thought was around two years old and had a cub, and, and that was a little bit early. Um, and you didn't feel that that cub was actually going to make it, would... Oh, it, it did. It did. If it was dead on, our, dead on arrival, we got there as long as been deceased. Sometimes they'll eat them, to be, not be morbid, but this one, she was still black, for, not, not personified, but pretending it was alive. Mm -hmm. it's been, it was dead for a while. Just because she didn't have the wherewithal to know what to do? She didn't have the body size to hold the proper condition. Okay. And. She didn't have, didn't know exactly what to do. The den she was in was kind of, again, crappy, for lack of a better term. Um, it got flooded out with some of those weird rains we had, so she had to move up and out and exposing herself and the cub. If she didn't get flooded out, probably would have made it. She wasn't that poor body shape, but she was, you know, she was only 87 pounds. But that, that, that's average for a bear that size, but then she had the little cub draining on that. It's just, it, it's just not, 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 not typical. Right, yeah, but she went in. She had enough, a well enough body condition going in, that her body didn't abort or absorb the cub. So she did get bred. She did have the cub full term, and then a lot of times you don't see either they eat, they eat the cub or they abort it. We, we don't know how what the rate of them actually getting pregnant is. It's probably pretty high because they do they can come in a cycle if their body temperature, you know, their body condition is good. So that's something we're going to kind of watch for a little more, maybe hit the dens a little bit earlier for those aged bears to see if there is a cub. You know, a lot of times like, they'll, they'll eat it once they know it's dead and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of ongoing aha moment. I don't know a lot about that yet. Just another quick question. Sure. So from I'm here all night. <laughs> a problem, no. A problem there. So you're going to call the police department first, then they call you, or you just is that routine? No, the best case is, hey, there's a bear. Cool. Get your camera, take a picture, go back to bed. Well, no. <laughs> but, no, but if, 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 if there's a bear <coughs> on the tree right here, nowhere for it to go, call, call the environmental police, but call, I'd call local PD first. Okay. They can get somebody here to get the lucky lose back. You'd be amazed how many people come out of the woodwork when there's a bear in the tree, especially if it's a little one. And then usually the environmental police will come out. Um, whether they're on the LARC team or not, we don't, there's plenty of them that aren't, and then eventually we'll, we'll show up. Or the environmental police on the special team will show up, depending on what time of day it is. And if we get the people back, let the bear come down on its own, we're going to do that. If that's not going to happen, it'll come down drug, and then be moved. Because we had a rabbit fisher cat that was doing flips on my lawn, and we called the PD and they didn't get there too quick, but the environmental police took quite a while. And then they were up in the yeah. woods just all going crazy trying to find it. The, the environmental police, I think there's one officer for seven or eight towns here. Oh, and wow. he's covering yeah. other towns too. They're, they're heavily short staffed. Yeah. So if, if it's an immediate public safety threat, call, call your local PD. Okay. We don't carry guns, so I can't put down a rabbit fisher. We just, we don't. I carry tranquilizers and all that stuff. If it's an immediate problem, the town PD or the environmental police will handle that. Um, there have been cases where we can't get there quick enough and the bear is an immediate threat to people or kids or something and they do have to be put down sometimes. But as you, again, most of those were people, there weren't problems, it became a people problem, the bear just happened to be there, unfortunately. But keep going. Um, do the bears keep going back to the same den all the time? Or do they is that a yes and no. Their whole life um, we don't know. The, the, one, the one in Templeton went to the same spot twice. Um, we got another bear over by Quabbin that is, has used only two sites three times. 
we got other bears that pick the worst places on the on this planet to dam randomly. So if it's a good spot, they tend to go back, but some bears never find a good spot. They just end up in a laurel pile, a bramble pile, and that's what they use. We're not really sure why they do what they do, whether they learn to learn behavior, but I am seeing trends. So I have a couple of third generation bears, so their mother, so their grandmother was in the study, or is in the study, their mother's in the study, and now they're in there. If they grew up, or lack of a term, grew up in a crappy den, they tend to pick crappy dens. Um, I've yet to see, because I'm just getting a couple of bears now that have really, think of a bear den, first thing you think of in your head, nice little hole in a stone wall or something, that are using that. So I'd be curious to see two inches from now when those cubs are big enough to have their own <coughs> dens by themselves where they end up. And generally speaking, dens that the mother's going to give birth in, so she doesn't have teenagers following when she picks these, tend to be better than the ones where she has the, the cubs tailing her. And then denning with her. So it's kind of a not a good answer, but we, we don't know. What's the average life expectancy of a bear? Like the, one of the big male bears, for example. I'm still working on that for this state where you're looking at 20 plus years, 25 years. Yeah. We haven't had enough bears collared with a known age. So if we get them very reproductive without ripping teeth out, we can't tell you how old they are. So we don't know how old they are when they're starting in the study. So we can figure out afterwards, but 20, 20 years is pretty pretty relative before they succumb to a, a bigger bear, a road. But 20 years of crossing Route 2, eventually, or Mass Pike, mm -hmm. we're seeing something that is, they get whacked. Eventually, they run into people, unfortunately. Is um, Mass Wildlife a state agency, or do you refer to DCR? No, we're the tiny little brother of DCR. We're we're actually a we're a state agency, so we have a director all the way down through. We have offices across the state, but we are funded solely by hunting and fishing licenses, permits, um, donations, bond bills, things like that. So we take zero money from the general fund. So basically, people who hunt, fish, trap buy licenses, um, if you've ever heard of the Pittman Robinson Act, and there's another one for fishing, I can't remember it, but, so there's, there's a surcharge, if I go to buy a box of ammunition or a duck call, small portion of that goes to the federal government, which reimburses us for projects like this. So it's, I get yelled at sometimes, my tax dollars, I'm like, no, your tax dollars don't. It's, the hunting and fishing is our big, is what pays us, so. This is just a small portion of what we do. Um, we got a guy in Westboro, that's, this is all he does is bears, that's the head bear biologist. Um, today it's bears, tomorrow it's going to be bears, next week it's going to be eagles for me. So I do everything. Um, but it's all funded from hunting and fishing. So a lot of the guys that work under me this time of year are probably the truck stocking reports, you see the stocking trucks go by doing, they actually do a um, little park and holding here, it's called over there, I can't think of the name of it off Street. Uh, yep, we stock that. But th that's that's our bread and butter. But we, for hunting and fishing, we do the fish, we do the pheasants and all that stuff. And then we do all the wildlife research. Um, DCR does the state parks and picnic tables and all that stuff. We have over 200,000 acres under our control, but we manage that exclusively for wildlife. We don't put trails in, we don't put roads in, we don't have visitor centers, we don't have picnic tables. Uh, put your boots on, put your binoculars on around your neck, and you'll see wildlife on our properties. There's no trails, almost no roads. So we're a little different than them. A lot smaller. So the papa bear's got pretty easy. He goes off and pregnants a, a sow, a female bear, and then goes off, moves on to another territory. She's got to go through the bird. Oh, the, 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 yeah, but the big bear's got to defend from all the little bears. Really? Yeah, he's, they're constantly needling him to try to overtake him. Um, you actually don't see a lot of the big, big bears around here. They're just not, not here and they're not making it that long. They're, they're fighting amongst themselves for, for dominance. So the, the biggest bear is kind of for, for the saying is always a bigger bear. <laughs> they're starting to find that. I'm starting to see it around uh, Peter Sam Way coming this way. That, you know, the 300 pounder that you know, people can see in the yards, well, all of a sudden there's a 500 pounder around and 300 pounder's gone. Yeah. And he's either getting run out or 
a lot of times when they get displaced, they don't show up again, or we're not seeing them again in calls, but we think they're getting killed, basically, territorially disputes. But they, their, their territories can be 100 square miles, or the females can be 10 or 12. So we don't have callers on the males because we just can't keep track of them. Am I off the hook anymore? Um, what about bear repellent? I, I thought I saw that down in south. They said carry bear repellent. Yep. I don't know we in the car You either. certainly can if you want. If it's that close, <laughs> you're already screwed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Like I said, you're, you're better off whistling than carrying berry pollen. Just don't, the key is don't spread it. Yeah. Even if, like I said, even you going out to, to get your newspaper in the morning, you know, bang your, slam your screen door, slam down the steps. Um, if, you're, if it makes you feel better hiking with berry pellet, you're probably going to end up using it on a dog before you did it on a bear. It's, I don't think any, I don't think there's ever been a bear in the state sprayed with repellent. That's been reported that an aggressive bear for whatever, or a defensive bear. I wouldn't like to call them aggressive, they're usually defensive. And another thing we see, like, I've done dens where the dark mist, sow's coming out and just sidestep. They, they want nothing to do with you, unless they're associating you with food. Then they'd be a little more hesitant, a little more interested. And like, like the slides are saying, the more they associate you, you as a person, you as a people, people in general, with food, the less they're going to be jumpy and bolt for the woods. They may just saunter off. Eventually they may stand their ground. And you'll have to go back inside. And now we have a problem there. And we don't, there's been a few, we don't want to see problem there. So you better take preventative measures before it becomes a problem. Do bears have an excellent sense of smell? Mm -hmm. Bears have fairly crappy eyesight, mm -hmm. really good hearing, and exceptional smell. I had a bear about eight years ago. I had a bear in my garage. It was not there when I pulled the car in. By the time I went into the house, I heard my can of bird seed being knocked over. You don't live in Templeton, do you? No, I okay. live in Princeton. It sounds very familiar to a bear we have in Templeton. And I, uh, you know, unfortunately, I have one of those peepholes in my door, and I looked out, and there was a bear in my in my garage. But the, yeah, they can certainly, if you have a can with the remains of a 50 pound bag in it, they can certainly smell that. Right through the metal? I mean, the lid's yeah. on? Oh. How did he know it was there before he got in the garage? Did he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that bear's not going in your garage for the heck of it. He's not sightseeing. No. Well, it's, it's kind of like any about them. They're not going to waste energy trying to get somewhere that they don't need to be. Yeah. Unless there's something in there they want. Yeah. In this case, for example, the one of the bear in town will a picture of her in the garage. Lady left both doors open, big barrel of bird seat in between, and she's knocked it open, raking it in, laying in the garage. <laughs> My husband arrived in his car about 10 minutes later. It was, it was 9 o'clock at night. And that's why when you said 9 o'clock is a good time to have bears in your yard. The minute the bear saw the car lights, he took off, and we've never oh, seen Oh, yeah, that's good. And if you do have a bear you don't want in the yard, just make it uncomfortable. Yeah, we've never seen another yeah. one. This is not like your coyote, like if they do the coyote, you know, be dumb in the yard. Just let them know you're there and then just make it uncomfortable. Air horns work, your neighbors hate you, but air horns work. <laughs> and, and like I said, they don't remember that part too. They, they, they remember the good, but they remember the bad. Yeah. Um, some of the bears we have for research won't go into certain areas because I think they associate them with us. <laughs> but that's, that's my opinion, but I, don't, I can't prove that. But they tend to have a bad experience with us and then not go back there. Yeah. Are you the same group that did the, uh, we had a couple of years back, we had someone came and talked about the coyotes. Are you the same group? Same agency probably, it wasn't made. He, did a, he had done a study and I, I thought he was from some college or something. What, what town? Or Tufts. I don't remember, but it was a couple of years was it ago. Dave Waddles from UMass? Maybe, maybe. He's doing a coyote talk right now getting crucified on the Cape. <laughs> oh. so, <laughs> I chose this one, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Coyotes are adapting way better than they're bears. They're a lot braver than they used to be. They don't come right up to you now. They don't, you don't make a noise and they go away like the guy said. Coyotes are becoming fully urbanized. It's 
around here, bears are still the bigger problem, not bigger problem, the bigger concern that I get calls about. If you went to 495, east of 495, to some of the Weston and whatever other towns are out there, towards Boston, it gets coyotes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Oh, I hear all the time. Yeah. Uh, in town, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like owls, coyotes, crack the window. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I have yet to see a bear on my property, though. Like, my neighbor tells me on my front porch a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I moved the time my wife wanted to see a bear, so I, know, I knowingly hung a crappy bird feeder up, and I still haven't found my pole. <laughs> that was a couple of years ago. Oh, the pole's gone. I don't know. It's in the woods somewhere. <laughs> but it didn't take long. Foxes? If I had to pick one animal from Holden and they get more calls on it, would be foxes. Mm -hmm. And they, they, that's a direct result of all the development. They're, they're getting, their dens, their home ranges and dens are, are very condensed. They're a very small area they, they operate in, so if they're bulldozing like they're doing up on the other side of town here by West Boston, they're just displacing foxes, so they're going to be popping up in places that people don't necessarily want them. Do we have to worry about little dogs? Yes. Yes. Little dogs and cats with foxes, more so coyotes. Um, foxes will defend if they're under your deck or under your porch or something. Um, best thing to do is, I'll touch on foxes, why not? Um, they're going to have their litters pretty soon, and come May, my phone's ringing off the hook. I get little coyote, little uh, foxes in my yard, that's what I do. The best thing you can do is let them be for two or three more weeks, just you know, so I'm talking. Let them be to like the end of June, if you can deal with them that long. And then go over to Jed's and get a box of mothballs and chuck them under where the den is. The mothballs, so they don't like the smell. They don't like the smell. The and it, it, it'll displace them. And they'll, they'll take the pups will be big enough to leave, and they'll all leave. Um, if you did it earlier, they'll all leave, but the pups won't be in the best condition to be doing that. So I try to say, you know, if you can tolerate them for a little bit longer, let it be. And then the key is to close up what they were in with stone or concrete or wire or something they're not going to dig up. <coughs> yes, sir. When the bears hit the orchards and they gorge and puke repeatedly, yep. uh, do, do they have, does that benefit them somehow? Nope. <laughs> they're just they can't stop. <laughs> 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 it's very common. Uh, part of that could be because they, they are slightly intoxicated. If they're eating a lot of drops, later, drops. Later, later, in, later in the season. I've seen, I've seen it twice where an uncoordinated bear that wasn't sick. But I, I got called, it's out there right now puking, and just keep eating. It's hungry. It doesn't want to spoil it yet. No, but there's, there's no biological benefit to eating and puking. One way down <laughs> that I know of. 20 feet away, and just sat there and ate the apples. And then when he got up and done, he just looked at me, and the bear could grin, just ran off. At least he went down right in on me, 20 feet away. That's cool. Yellowstone. Anybody else? Any, any animals? I'm a uh, jack of all trades, master of nothing. <laughs> How many eagle nests on uh, watch you sit for them? Right this moment today? None. That I know of. The old one blew out. I don't know where it is. We're going out Friday looking. Um, you got one on Pine Hill, mm -hmm. around the edge of town yeah. over there. I think that's the one on Lake Quinsig now. We might have two on Lake Quinsig. I think those yeah. You got one on Wachusa Lake right below the mountain up this way. What's that? Where about time? You, you, uh, you know what the big fancy Route 9 bridge is? Yeah. You stand there and look south towards Flint Pond. There's an island <coughs> at about 1 o'clock. It's on Drake Island over by the town of Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. And there might be one on Flint Pond, not rearing chicks this year, but I've been getting calls of a second pair that direction. So that'd be kind of cool. Yes, sir. Do fisher cats actually make a noise? Have nope, it's, it's a fisher. They're not related to cats or a weasel. I have to tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, no, you, you're hearing red or gray foxes. Fishers just hiss and spit. Um, you, you hear like a crying little girl in the woods, that's a red fox. It sounded more like an asthmatic screech. Mm -hmm. Probably a fox, yeah. uh, more than likely. Um, I've had fishers and traps and stuff, and they make noise, but nothing you're going <laughs> to get your neck hairs up over. Yeah. It's um, not loud. It's, it's a low, scratchy, hissy, hard to sound. Yeah, if it sounds like a little a child of some sort <coughs> screaming, it's a fox. It's not. Don't blame the poor fishers. Okay. <laughs> yep. About um, I don't know how many years ago, was TNG have an article about 
the return of the Kuka because we have the prey and the habitat. Somebody had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to go there. Well, is, is it true? I've, I've heard different things. It but depends it on true. who you ask. I think we. Are they in the state? Is there one in the state right now? There was one know. killed in yep. Connecticut a couple of years yep. ago. There was. It, it, yep. It came from Massachusetts yep. through the western part of the state. The and there are 17 confirmed pictures of it from this state. And that's one animal in the state for eight days. Wow. Now think about that for a second. If we had a breeding population, I should have thousands of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, I get reports every year. Someone sends me a picture. Trace, trace it backwards, where'd you get it from? My, my third cousin twice removed. Well, can you get a hold of them for me? Yep. Well, I got them from my neighbor, and I've never had one that I couldn't find on Google Image Reverse Search out of Montana, <laughs> or find out actually who took it. And I had a really compelling one last year that had the right time of year and the right uh, flora, right? Trees and bushes and stuff around it. But traced it all over to Sharon and in the garage, and then the guy's like, well, I don't know where I got the picture. Well, he took the picture. And that, he just dropped that stuff. So. Well, supposedly that was a, if, if, if I recall the article, it was supposedly a Kuga expert that they interviewed. And they said he, within 10 years. So th there's so several eight, Cougar, eight Cougar experts um, on an official capacity right now, so I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no breeding population here. Is there the odd male? Absolutely. This year, maybe not. Next year, maybe not. The year after, maybe. But the one that got whacked in Connecticut by a car came out of the Badlands of South Dakota. They genetically tested it to a subpopulation there. So all the fishing and wildlife agencies got together and pooled their resources. It came out of South Dakota, went up through the Midwest United States, up into Canada, down through upstate New York, oh across Western Mass, into Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of pictures of one animal. So again, we had a whole population. I have thousands of pictures. But will they get here eventually? I don't know. Will the wolves get here eventually? I think it'd be cool, but not probably not in my lifetime. I don't think. I just don't think things move things can move that fast. So the male, the transient males, absolutely. Even wolves. Um, we had one in Sherborne a few years ago that the uh, farmer shot. It's eating sheep. But it ended up being a hybrid for somebody's mm -hmm. pet, sort of. Yep. That's a good deterrent for the hawks and the vultures, because I bring my dog out of my deck, my little no. dog, yep. and no. they're always... The vultures won't bother anything oh. in your yard. The, the hawks either. Well, I know. We'll get to the hawks in a minute. Oh. The vul vultures won't bother anything. They're, they're just ri either riding the thermals or they're sitting, sunning themselves on your garage door. Um, the hawks... The biggest, well, aside from eagles, the biggest hawk we have is probably the red tail. And it'll, it, it'll grab your yippy dog if you got one, maybe. Um, more likely than not, you're going to have a nest nearby. It's going to be a defensive strike. Um, in terms of protecting it, there's not much you can do other than stand out there with it. From just a, a hawk's not going to grab your dog for supper. It's just not going to happen. But if there's a red tail nest right next door, or even worse, a cooper's hawk nest, um, there will be defensive swooping and whacking and strikes and stuff. Well, I'm down there 190, and we do have a ton of hawks, and we have. I never let my toy poodle out by itself, anyways. Yes, the, the because every time, even holding the dog, they're still like maybe 10, 15 feet higher. Yeah, they're they're not there eyeballing. The, I'm sure. They're, no, <laughs> um, they, they actually use the highway cars to hunt, especially this time of year. Well, not well, like two weeks ago, we had a little bit of snow on the ground, but the highway cars were all clear of snow, and they're just dirty grass. They love hunting that area. Mm -hmm. So the net, there's a higher population down by your house yeah. than there is, generally speaking. But if you're out there with your dog, they're not going to they're not going to use a prey item. If it's in a big, wide open space, um, maybe if it's desperate. But you know, squirrels a pretty good task for it. A eight or ten pound dog. That's what I heard. They can't really lift more than like three pounds. Maybe. I. I can't think of any instance in my district, which is all of Worcester County, where I've had a call where a, ha a hawk attacked a dog predatorily. I've had them whack dogs because the dog's near the nest, but I haven't whacked me on the other nest. But no, not something I would generally worry about. Okay. Um, I'd be more concerned about coyotes, and that can be deterred by just being out there with it. Is that stock so deflating? Ebbing and flowing. Um, 
I went to the. I heard Fisher's uh, getting into this. It's always kind of been like that. Um, I think, as opposed to declining, I think you're seeing a, an increase in the red tails, red shouldered Coopers, Sharpshin, that type of thing, which is just displacing them a little bit, and you're just not seeing them as much because you're seeing the other ones, so you're not noting them as readily. But as a, a scientific decline, generally speaking, no. Um, if anything, we have a, a surge right now because the acorns we've had the last, well, the previous two and three years ago have bolstered the chipmunk and squirrel population. So the hawk population and owl population, I'm sure you've all seen owls whacked out here. Um, huge numbers of those right now. So they're, they're hunting everything, everywhere, just trying to keep up and they're getting hit by cars and stuff using the uh, <coughs> highway corridors. That's what they like to hunt. Have I exhausted you all yet? Um, I understand that the wild turkeys, you can't chew them away. And um, we get a flock in the backyard, and I want to go out with my dog, and they won't move. So I tried doing an umbrella. Someone said, go like that, because that doesn't work, and the crusts are protected, and I can't do anything. What can you do to get them out of your yard? Or to they move them along? Well, what are they eating? I don't know. They keep going down to the ground. I don't know. Do you have bird feeders out? No. I don't. Okay. Usually they'll scratch that up. Um, turkeys are tough. Really? Um, we're working on a policy on how to deal with them right now. Right? Uh, some of the urban ones. The females aren't going to bother you. Right. This time of year the males can get kind of aggressive. Um, I've had them come at me. Why doesn't well, an umbrella work? It, it's, a, it's a dominance thing with the males. And I guess they're not scared of you. They're not scared, <laughs> they're not scared of me either. So, you know, unless they get a boot or something into the side of them, and then they realize, oh, then they'll stay away. But um, I, get I don't have a good answer for that if it's other than to try to just shoo it away or just give me a call and I can try to shoo it away. Um, I got them in downtown Shrewsbury. I have them at UMass Med yeah. School by Lakewood Sigmund. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, we're, 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 working on, we're working on that. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, become, there's, the whole flock is setting up in urban areas, and this time of year the males get, it's breeding season, so they're getting aggressive. They're going after hubcaps. You're seeing the reflection of hubcaps, you're seeing the reflection of bumpers. <laughs> um, yeah. and the majority of it that I'm seeing, it, it starts with somebody thinking, hey, this is great, throw some bird seed out up at the campus or something. That starts it, but it, the birds move around, and then once they associate people, they're not scared of them anymore, and then they, they see them as a, a dominance threat kind of thing until you prove them wrong. But a lot of people don't have the ability to get close enough to want to, <laughs> to do that. But so th these were coming at me. You started it. Wait it out? You just wait it out until they go small? That would be ideal. I mean, if you can work around them, that would be the best. You know, I like having answers, but I, we don't have an answer for how to deal, effectively deal with them yet that's not going to get people hurt. Um, they do have big spurs. Um, they do hurt. Um, the wings can bruise and break fingers and bones. They can jar enough. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't have a straight answer for that one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Have you uh, monitored the uh, dead deer in the reservoirs yeah. in regards to the eagles this year? Uh, in regards to the hunters, I have. I actually just finished up the transects out there. Uh, we walked predetermined lines, randomly laid, looking for, for deer remains, deer poop, browse surveys, things like that. You can punch all that into a fancy computer and it gives us deer per square mile. So yes, I, I've just been walking out there. Um, eagles, did, eagles don't take a deer down, but if uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of deer strikes on 70, Route 70, it runs the, other, the west, east side of the reservoir. Um, and we'll grab those deer, the DCR range will grab those and put them out on the ice. The eagles will get them. Um, and coyotes have learned to chase deer out on the ice and they can pull them down out there and then the eagles benefit from that. That's, that's what I've seen, uh, three, three deer on the ice here. There were five immatures and two matures on yep. one, one carcass here. Yep. On three, three days per carcass between the coyotes and oh, they, the yeah, they don't last long. When, gone. when we can get a hold of a roadkill locally, we'll bring it down below our office right on the reservoir. Um, put a trail camera on it, a really high definition trail camera. We can read bands if, if they're in the right orientation, which is kind of cool. But there's at least three, three I know that ended up on the ice that we didn't put there. Right, that's what I was doing. 
but there's still plenty of deer in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Even after they had, they had a hunting season this year to try to help the forest restore itself. There was, if you've ever walked through, especially over by the Stone Church on the Route 110 side of Washusa Reservoir, it looks like a park. All the trees are this big and there's nothing new growing. It's like, man, it's just nothing left in there for food. Um, the deer that came through, every deer harvested out there had to come through my office, which is around the reservoir, to be biologically weighed, checked, aged, sexed, all that type of stuff. And deer that should have been 60 pounds were 35 or 40. You know, fully grown deer, but they're just, they're, they're stunted. So it'd be interesting to see where this goes next few years. As the forest comes back, if the deer herd gets healthier out there, they're, they're just overpopulated because you couldn't, you couldn't hunt anywhere near, anywhere uh, east of 190 on any watershed land. So the deer were running amok, just literally destroying the forest. Kind of like Quaffin was 25 years ago. <coughs> we done? All right. Glad to see all of you uh, come uh, to this uh, talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Great chance to answer all of your questions. Uh, the Friends of the Red Barn um, will be uh, offering other programs, both on the barn grounds and uh, programs like this uh, when appropriate. Um, our uh, mission states that, that we will preserve the Fairbanks barn, known as the Red Barn, uh, its surrounding grounds. Uh, we'll do education. Uh, for the public and farm life, uh, culture, practices of the 19th century New England, and encouraging a contemporary appreciation of nature, ecology, agriculture, handcraft, community, and the interdependence of human life with the natural world. And certainly this... You don't have that memorized? <laughs> <laughs> So we, not only are we interested in, in Holden's history and agricultural history, but, but how we uh, interact with, with the land and with the